Thank you for downloading this podcast from The Reedy Clubby Show on Talk Radio 702 and 567 Cape Talk. For more, please go to 702.co.za or capetalk.co.za. Talk Radio 702 and 567 Cape Talk. The Naked Scientist. Chris, good morning. Sorry to sh- move you around. Cancel. Then we back on. Then we off. Sorry about that. Welcome. Hello. <laughs> Thank you very much. So we stumbled upon something. Personal odors. Personal smell. Do men and women give off different smells? Well, really, that's what Wen Zhu and her colleagues at the Chinese Academy of Sciences in Beijing are saying. Uh, it's been contentious for a long while whether or not these things called pheromones actually exist in humans. These are chemicals that can change our behavior towards people. They're usually used as mating signals. We've had a vague inkling that they might exist, but no one's got any really objective evidence of the chemistry behind this until this group did this very intriguing set of experiments. What they did was to recruit big groups of men and women. They showed them what we call a dot pattern. Basically, you draw a figure of a person in dots, and they did it with dots so that the figure wasn't overtly male or overtly female because they didn't want to bias the person who was asked to watch the dots. And they asked the dots, using a computer program, to walk along. And the idea was that the person who was watching the moving dots had to decide whether it was a male gate or a female gate. And before they did the experiment, they exposed the men to a female hormone called estrotetraenol, um, which is judged to be a female pheromone. It's pr- present in various female secretions. And they also did the same experiment with women that were previously exposed to andros- androstadienone, which is a, a presumed male pheromone. And when the people were given these pheromones before they looked at the dot patterns, they were at least 10% more likely to say that the moving figure was a man uh, or a woman according to what the opposite sex was. In other Mm. words, these pheromones were biasing their perception of a visual stimulus and making them think it was something that was more feminine if they were a male or more masculine if they were female. But then they did the intriguing experiment of saying, well, what happens if we recruit people who are homosexual and Mm -hmm. obviously attracted to someone who's their own sex? And under those circumstances, the effect was flipped round. So you give the male pheromone to these homosexual males, and they're more likely to say that the moving figure is male, 10% more often, and the same for the women. So it looks like these chemicals go into the nose. They strongly stimulate a part of the brain, probably in your hypothalamus, which is concerned with behavior and the integration of information. And this, in turn, then affects your visual system. So it shows that these chemicals that we give off in various secretions and in sweat, underarm odor, that kind of thing, strongly influence the way not just people behave towards us, but also the way they even see us. Mm, that's absolutely fascinating and, uh, and and the implications as well. Very, very interesting indeed to read about that. Okay, our lines are open for you on 021-446-0567-011-883-0702. I've got a question here about the effect on of caffeine on your heart rate. Somebody claims after a cup of coffee their heart races. What does it mean for your heart to race in the first place? Do you know, it's really funny you should say that because I was literally picking up my cup of coffee. <laughs> Me <and> too. Said, <laughs> I've got <"Yep>, mine now. <laughs> slurp, slurp. I can't function without the stuff. But um, the, the evidence is that it's absolutely true that caffeine will boost your heart rate. And the reason for that is that caffeine is a kind of chemical called a methylxanthine. And methylxanthines inhibit enzymes, which are molecular pairs of scissors in our cells, called phosphodiesterases. And these phosphodiesterases break down signals in the cell, which are produced when adrenaline circulates in the bloodstream. So effectively, if you stop the body breaking down the adrenaline signal, it makes it as though you have more adrenaline in your bloodstream than you really do. So as a result, it will potentiate the action of the adrenaline, increasing heart rate. It will make you breathe more deeply and more quickly. It will dilate your pupils. It will also make you sweat more and maybe have a fine tremor all of which uh, are symptoms we can probably identify with if we've had a few too many cups of coffee. So it's absolutely true. Our lines are open for you on 021-446-0567-011-883-0702. We are taking your SMSs as well on 31702 and 31567. Chris, you are in Italy, Chris, am I right? Yes, I'm in a place called Sorrento, which is not far from Naples. 
and I can see out of my window Mount Vesuvius. Ah. And that's actually part of the reason why I've come here, because uh, there is two of the most amazing archaeological sites in the world here, because Vesuvius erupted in yes. AD 79, so 1,900 years ago or so, and in the process it completely halved in size. It was twice the height it is now. And the material that it blew off when it did that was deposited over a number of settlements locally around the mountain. One of them was Pompeii. The other was uh, Herculaneum and buried those cities, one of which was a town of some 20,000 people. That was Pompeii. The other one, um, Herculaneum, was a bit smaller, probably four or 5,000 inhabitants. They were buried under 16 metres of ash that was deposited from the volcano and only rediscovered in the case of Herculaneum, probably in the 1700s, people began to do amateur archaeology, but uh, only more recently in the, in the case of professional archaeology, and they've been uncovered, and the 16 metres of ash and debris have been removed, and the cities are still there, and the, the degree of preservation is absolutely stunning and uh, just blows your mind. And I've been walking around these, these ancient sites and, and taking photographs and the beautiful murals, the wall paintings. Oh. Uh, many of the houses are still standing. You can look at the the timbers which are in the doors and the door frames and you think wow that that piece of wood has been there for 2,000 wow, years amazing. Um, absolutely astonishing so I'm, I'm having a bit of an archaeological <laughs> trip <laughs> oh no that sounds amazing it's not just the history it's not just that but the just the history of it as well very fascinating lucky lucky fish our lines are open for you I've got a question about toothpaste I've got question a question about yawning let's take a break we'll deal with them when we return Talk Radio 702 and 567 Cape Talk. The Naked Scientist. 18 minutes past 10 o'clock. Our lines are open for you on 021-446-0567 or double one double eight three zero seven zero two. Austin in Randburg. Hi. Good day. How are you? Fine, fine. Your question? Yes. Um, I just wanted to check. Um, has the earth mass changed since the time of creation or formation? And if so, has it increased or decreased with the amount of... Uh, people that are on the earth and the resources that we are burning almost on a daily basis. Okay. Chris, you got that? Um, there was a little bit of breakup, and I missed the, the question at the beginning. Could okay. You just he wants to know, has the earth's mass changed since its formation? Yes, lovely question. The answer is no, very little. And the reason for that is the earth is what we call a closed system. The material that we're made of we get the materials that form a human being by eating food. Where does the food come from? Well, that's us eating an animal or eating a plant, which in turn gets its materials it's made from, from the ground or from the atmosphere, because trees and plants take in CO2 and water, merge them together chemically using the energy and sunlight, that's photosynthesis, to make sugars, and then sugars are built up into other chemicals that are more complex, and they then enter our bodies, we break them apart again and rearrange them in our bodies. So as a result, the Earth isn't actually really, in the grand scheme of things, changing its mass very much. That said, it is probably gaining mass very, very slightly every year. Why is that? Well, there's a lot of material raining down on the planet from space, and uh, that's in the form of dust, largely, tiny meteors which come in from space, um, iron-rich bits of meteorite, which you can detect if you run a, a magnet over some dust or uh, in your water butt, stuff that's come off of your or you, roof of your house because they rain down from the sky um, coming in from space. The Earth is also getting a little tiny bit warmer every year, and if you add energy to a system with E equals mc squared, E energy is m mass times the speed of light squared, if you add energy to the system because the Earth is getting a little bit warmer, then it must increase its mass to keep the equation balanced. So on that basis, the Earth is probably becoming very slightly heavier every year. And of course, if we go right back to the year dot, the Earth is a bit bigger than it was when we started because we started with a smaller planet, but very close to the origin of the solar system, about four and a half billion years ago, the Earth collided with another planet, which was called Thea, and it was about the size of Mars. The two merged together, and they ejected some of the crust of the new planet out into the orbit around the, the, the new Earth, and that coalesced to form the moon. So that's why we have such a big moon. So we're actually a slightly bigger planet, and since that time we've also had various comets and things come and deliver a lot of the water we now have on Earth. So we, we've got bigger over time, but now the Earth's mass is probably changing very little. Let's go to, is it Richard? Thank you very much, Austin, for that brilliant question. Richard in Pretoria, hi. Hi, 
Ready, money. Yes. Uh, Chris, uh, I want to know why is it when it hailstorms, it all. Oh no! So I'm um, yeah. here. Okay, it, when there's a hailstorm, what happens? It always comes in round balls. Does it not come in squares or triangles? Or... <laughs> yeah, wouldn't that be exciting if we could have hailstones in multiple shapes? They, they form a round blob because the hailstone is just frozen rain droplets. And if you look at rain droplets, they're round blobs as well. Mm. And the reason they're round droplets is because. The hailstones come from water vapor initially, which is in the atmosphere. And water is a sticky molecule, and it wants to arrange itself so that as many water molecules are as close to other water molecules as they can be. And the way in which you do that is to have the, the uh, a spherical shape. So the water forms into a tiny sphere, and then other water molecules glue themselves around mm-hmm. the outside. And it's the same reason, actually, that planets are round, because gravity is pulling them together. Oh, In yes. the case of a, a water droplet, you've got stickiness of water molecules pulling them into a spherical shape. And the hailstones just grow inside clouds because they go up through the water vapor in the cloud, gluing more water molecules on the surface. Then they fall down a bit and they go up again and fall down a bit, continuously growing new layers of water around the outside in rings. And that's why you end up with these usually round sort of or spheroid type shapes. Thank you very much, Richard. And then um, let's go to Clint. Clint in uh, Bedford View High. Hi, morning, Didi. Morning, Dr. Chris. Um, I listened to your show a couple of weeks ago. My aunt is a diabetic and she lost her eyesight due to the retina being detached. And um, you mentioned that research is underway to um, to fix the retina. Um, can you just explain to me and tell me what research has been done and if there's anything we can do? Okay. Uh, the line okay. wasn't so great, but uh, you, you got that, Chris? The aunt? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, the the reason with diabetes that people have vision problems is because the blood sugar of diabetics is often a bit too high. And this leads to blood vessels uh, not working as well as they should do. And parts of the retina, the light sensitive sheet of tissue at the back of the eye, become starved of oxygen. And when tissue becomes deprived of oxygen, it secretes growth factors that encourage the formation of new blood vessels to encourage more blood to flow to the area that's starved of blood. The problem is these new blood vessels are, are weak and flimsy and they're quite likely to bleed. And they bleed into the retina, and iron, which is in the hemoglobin in your red blood cells, is poisonous to the retina, and it kills the retinal cells. And this leads to sight loss over time. The retina also accumulates other waste products of metabolism. This is called drusen, and this accumulates under the retina, further starving the retina of oxygen and um, raw materials, and so the damage is accelerated. So what scientists are trying to do is to come up with ways to better regulate blood sugar. They're also trying to come up with ways to replace the cells in the retina which have been lost. Um, There's a number of ways of doing that, usually involving stem cells. So they're trying in some cases to just grow the cells that are lost so they could be implanted. They're also in some cases trying to grow a complete new sheet of retinal tissue that could be implanted. The other way that scientists are trying to do this is with electrical implants. And these are very clever. And the idea here is that you have a very small sheet of light-sensitive material. And this is connected via a, a special microchip, a bit of microcircuitry, to a stimulator which sits against the retina and sends out tiny pulses of electricity which activate the retinal nerve which goes in the optic nerve to the brain so that people can then begin to see spots of light corresponding to where light fell on this sheet of light sensitive tissue on the back of the eye. And these are becoming much better than they originally were to the point where people can now with admittedly relatively poor acuity but it's not zero acuity read letters and Mm. things like that see patterns of dots so it's certainly moving in the right direction but we've got a little bit of a way to go yet who came in first i think it was lynn in boxwick oh i'm interested in this i think we've spoken about car sickness before but not this one lynn in boxburg hi Mm, i'm going on a four-day cruise and i don't want to be sick all the time (laughs) what causes it and how can i prevent it Hi, Lynn. Well, we don't really know what the reason for motion sickness is. It seems that the body perceives this sensation of continual movement as some kind of threat. And the answer, logically enough or illogically enough, is to make you throw up. Not really sure why the body's reaction should be that. It seems that the motion subverts the normal uh, 
detection of something poisonous happening in your body mechanism, which is to then make you throw up. There are a number of ways to deal with motion sickness, and the best one is to take some antihistamines. There's a drug called cyclizine, which is an antihistamine, and because the sensation of movement in your what's called vestibular system in your inner ear, which is how you keep your balance, that communicates with your brain stem via histamine receptors. And if we take antihistamines, it seems to interrupt the signal getting from the movement centre into the I feel sick centre and stops people feeling so unwell. So if it is a problem for you, you could try some of that, um, cyclozine, and see if that makes you feel better. There's another one called stematil, which is, um, I think that's one called metoclopramide, uh, which can also be reasonable. Um, and they don't have terribly many side effects, and you can normally get them over the counter, so you could try either of those and then, and then hope that you just get used to it or just hope that the weather's nice and calm and then you shouldn't get seasick at all. <laughs> Enjoy the cruise, Lynn. Let's not forget about that. Enjoy the cruise. Mbongeni in Midrand, hi. Uh, morning, Rudy and Chris. Um, yes. I just want to know, how bad are energy drinks for a person? Because if you look at the range that you find in supermarkets and the pick and pays of the world, um, they're so huge. But then how do you know the effects of those on a person? Well, what I would say is that if you look at the state of the world's waistlines, they're going up, not down. Um, these energy drinks have a lot of calories in them and you really have to be doing a lot of exercise to need that much energy a lot of the time. Mm. And you, the best advice always is to just drink adequate water and then eat a balanced diet. There's very little that these energy drinks can add to a normal, healthy person who's doing normal levels of exercise or exertion. If you're okay. doing something Olympic, then, uh, or you're, you're playing tennis at Wimbledon against um, the world's greats, then perhaps you need something which will, which will be a bit more bespoke and tailored to you to get optimal performance. But to be frank and fair, for most of us going for a bike ride or a yeah. run, a bottle of water when you feel thirsty is all that you need on top of a normal uh, balanced diet that makes sure that you adequately replace the protein that you're breaking down in your muscles when you exercise so you can build better muscles afterwards and sugars to give you uh, glycogen in your muscles that you can quickly liberate to give you the energy you need to run and sprint. Mm. Mbongen, are you running the comrades on Sunday? Um, not at all. Really. Okay, unless you're running the comrades, <laughs> stay away from energy drinks. All right. <laughs> so the comrades run is run, running what ninety kilo, eighty nine k's. Uh, the down run is yeah, eighty nine kilometers. That's what they'll be running on uh, on Sunday. They will need energy drinks, a prayer, and more. And then uh, somebody wants to know how do antidepressants actually work, Chris? Well. If you'd asked that question uh, about 20, 30 years ago, people didn't really know the answer. They had an idea, but they didn't really know the answer. Now we have a much clearer idea that the way antidepressants work is that they manipulate the action of various nerve transmitter chemicals in the brain, as well as also probably influencing the way brain cells talk to each other, and also probably the birth of new nerve cells in the brain. So first let me explain. Most of these uh, antidepressant drugs work by targeting a class of chemicals in the brain called monoamines. And these are commonly noradrenaline and also serotonin and also dopamine. And they increase the levels of those nerve transmitter chemicals in the brain because if you look at people who are depressed, you find low levels of those chemicals. So it's not surprising that if you take drugs that increase the levels of those chemicals, they make people feel happier. We thought that was the be-all and end-all, that, that it was just a, a pharmacological effect. You increase the levels of these chemicals in nerve cells and people feel better. But what people couldn't explain is that when you start taking these antidepressant drugs, it's not immediate, the mood-elevating effect. People still continue to feel a bit down for a few weeks and then they feel much better but you can see the effect of the nerve transmitter chemicals coming up almost immediately when you start taking the drug. So how do we account for that? Well, now what scientists have noticed in recent years is that these same antidepressant drugs also promote the production and survival of new nerve cells in the brain. There are several sites in the human adult brain where, contrary to original prevailing wisdom, we do make new nerve cells throughout life. And those nerve cells, most of the time, don't survive for very long. But if you take antidepressants or you have exercise, regular exercise, or you have sex, interestingly, hmm. all of those three things, and I don't know what the combination of all three would be like, but possibly <laughs> even better, um, th this strongly promotes the survival of these cells. And 
what scientists are now beginning to wonder is if these cells act like a sticking plaster and that they wire themselves into the nervous system and help to make up for the deficiency uh, that is leading to the depression in the first place. So we think these drugs may work in a number of different ways, one of which is to change the levels of the, the, the chemicals that nerves use to talk to each other and that in people who are depressed where they're low, they increase the levels. The other is that perhaps they change the survival of these new nerve cells, increasing the number that wire themselves into the brain and helping to patch up whatever the deficiency was in the first place that led to the person feeling depressed. Thank you very much, Chris. We'll chat again next week. Enjoy Italy. Thanks very much, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.